So, uh, when will we start the webinar? Good afternoon, ma'am. We will be starting yeah, soon. Short, yeah, soon. Shortly, ma'am. Pardon? Pardon? Shortly, ma'am. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to open it. A very good afternoon to one and all. Respected principal ma'am, healthcare professionals, guest speaker, faculty members, and all the students gathered here today's webinar. On this auspicious occasion, we, on behalf of Tripura Institute of Paramedical Sciences, Tripura, is celebrating the 127th World Radiography Day. The whole world, we are also celebrating 8th November as World Radiography Day, like every year, to show our respect and honor to Sir Wilhelm von Wilhelm for his great discovery, and also to increase public awareness of the vital role that medical imaging and radiation therapy plays in healthcare. Yes, to be inspired is great, but to be an inspiration is an honor. It's our pleasure that. Today, we are having with us our respected principal madam from Tripura Institute of Paramedical Sciences to give away the welcome speech and start the webinar. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Good afternoon to you all. We are here to celebrate the World Radiography Day. Radiography Day. Today, the 8th November is observed as the Radiography Day to honor the discovery of X-ray by W.C. Ronten on this day. For this discovery, he was awarded Nobel Prize in 1901. Purpose of this celebration is to raise public awareness for the importance, importance of radiography in imaging and therapy, of which uh, imaging and therapy, which plays important role in the diagnosis and treatment of patients. Today, the, today's theme of this webinar is, uh, uh, is radiographers at the forefront 
uh, of the patient 50. Now, I welcome the speakers on this webinar, Dr. Ravi Kant, Chief Radiologist and HOD, Department of Radiology, Joshua Hospital, Hyderabad, and Dr. Suparna Mujumda, Professor and HOD, Chittaranjan National Cancer Institute of Kolkata. Now, let us start uh, with Dr. Ravi Kant. Uh, uh, let us start the program with the uh, 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 with the lecture of Dr. Ravi Kant. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, very good afternoon to everyone. Today, uh, I'm speaking about the radiation protection and safety. It was already So why uh, why we are uh, why this topic is very important is that uh, uh, as we all know that we are working with uh, uh, radiation day in and day in and day out we do a lot of work on X-rays CTs and uh, which generate a lot of radiation and uh, there is always uh, although the, although the CT and MRI are very CT and X-ray very useful for diagnosis they also give radiation so it is very essential for us to know. How much radiation is acceptable and what measures we can take to reduce the radiation exposure and uh, uh, enhance the radiation safety for the patients. So basically radiation is nothing but the energy emitted and uh, uh, from all these uh, x-rays and CT and it does not require any medium for, uh, for its transmission. So coming before starting the topic I would like to tell about the radiation doses and the units which are very important in our understanding about uh, uh, radiation. First is the absorbed dose. So absorbed dose is uh, defined as the amount of quantity of energy that gets deposited in one unit tissue. Uh, but this does not indicate the biological effect of the radiation because it doesn't take into consideration of the tissue and also the energy of the beam. It is measured in terms of rad and gray. Next, coming to equivalent dose. So, equivalent dose is actually uh, is nothing but an absorbed dose, which uh, to which we multiply the quality factor, like uh, different uh, types of radiations, like X-rays, electrons, neutrons, and photons have different energy levels. So, based on their quality factor, we can calculate the equivalent dose, and it is measured in terms of sieverts and rem. Coming to the most important thing is the effective dose. Effective dose is actually the uh, radiation dose which has got the biological impact. It is measured by multiplying the equivalent dose with tissue weighting factor. Tissue weighting factor is different tissues have got different uh, levels of uh, uh, radiation absorption. Based on the tissue weighting factor, the effective dose will vary. Uh, this is an example. Example where normal X-ray. Uh, hello. Yes. Yeah, tell me. Yes, sir, sir yeah. your slides are not playing. Sir. Not playing. Not playing. Uh, slides are not moving, sir. Would you please kindly check no. out? No, no. No, sir. It's not uh, in uh, slide share mode, sir. It's slide share. Slide share. No, no, you're able to see. Sir, can you please? Yeah, now it's playing, sir. It yeah. is in talking presentation mode, sir. Hello. Yes. Now it's now it's okay. So you can see the slides here. Now you can see the slides. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now you can see that. Okay. So yes, these are the different. Uh, uh, these are different uh, uh, effective doses for various uh, investigations. 
like chest x-ray uh, the normal exposure is around 0 0.02 millisieverts so depending on the body composition for the same x-ray if you take an x-ray of the abdomen it is equal to 1 millisievert because there is more tissue in abdomen and it absorbs more of the radiation and uh, uh, one chest it is uh, equal to 8 millisieverts and on this side we can see the table like they compare one x-ray with the exposure of uh, other investigations for example if you do one ct chest it's almost equal to 400 chest x-rays next coming to the biological effects of radiation there are two main biological effects of radiations that is deterministic effect and stochastic effects deterministic effects are actually the effects uh, these are the effects which you don't see in diagnostic radiology. These effects you see more, mostly in radiotherapy and in radiation accidents. Because uh, to get a deterministic effect, you need very high radiation dose, almost like uh, in the range of more than 0.5 gray. And this amount of, this amount of radiation is not uh, seen in a normal diagnostic work. Uh, in a deterministic effect, the effect will occur only when the radiation level crosses the threshold. Below the threshold, there is no effect. And as the radiation level increases, the severity also increases. Examples of this are like, uh, often we see patients in radiation, uh, undergoing radiation have uh, hair, hair loss and they have erythema and other changes. Some of them, some of them even develop cataract. So these all effects are uh, nothing but deterministic effects and their severity will increase as the amount of radiation increases. Coming to stochastic effects. These are the actual effects which we see in our uh, daily radio, uh, diagnostic radiology work. And these effects occur below 0.5 gray radiation exposure. The difference between stochastic and deterministic effect is that these effects do, does not require any threshold. And their severity will remain same, but the probability of effect will increase as the radiation dose increases. And there is no threshold. So common uh, stochastic effects are again classified into somatic effects where uh, the normal radiation exposure can cause alterations in the cells and can cause carcinogenesis. Normally our uh, body uh, organs like bone marrow, GIT mucosa, breast tissue, gonads and lymph nodes are very uh, sensitive for radiation exposure. So these uh, organs are more prone for radiation induced uh, cancers. Again, as I told you, these effects are stochastic. That means there is no definite threshold level at which you can tell that the effect will happen or the effect will not happen. But if you have more prolonged exposure to radiation, there is a more probability that the effect will happen. Again, radiation can also cause genetic effects. They can cause alterations in the, in the tissue DNAs and again lead to carcinogenesis. Fetal risk is also considered as a stochastic effect where uh, the if the fetus gets exposed during the early fetal period, especially during the second to eighth week, there is a chance in, uh, in aberrations in the organogenesis and can result in fetal anomalies. Again, the threshold exposure is less than one millisievert is considered uh, to be relatively safe, but any exposure more than one millisievert uh, is recommended to undergo MTP. Again, as I told you, fetal risk, if it's in the pre-implantation uh, time, that is during the first two weeks, it can cause spontaneous abortion. But most uh, crucial period is between second to eighth week, where most of the organogenesis occurs. If there is uh, radiation exposure during this period, then there's a high chance that uh, the uh, fetus can develop anomalies. After seven weeks, the severity of the Severity of radiation reduces because already organism occurs after eight weeks. Now coming to the radiation dose measurements. So radiation dose measurements can be done uh, in fluoroscopy. The radiation dose uh, can be measured either by using direct methods like TLD badges and radiochromic films or indirect method by using a dose area product, which is measured using ionization chambers. Dose area product is nothing but it's a dose which is calculated from the ionization chambers and uh, it is multiplied with the amount of area on which the exposure occurs. 
again a ct also there is ct do, ct uh, dose index in by which uh, which again uses ionization chambers to measure the amount of ct radiation radiation monitoring for individuals so there are different ways in which uh, radiation can be monitored like what amount of exposure the patient or the personnel who are working with uh, radiation get so it can be measured by various methods uh, some of the important methods are ionization method radiograph photographic effect luminescence and scintillation methods so commonly used devices for radiation monitoring are ionization chambers film batches and tld batches ionization chambers are usually used in uh, fluoroscopy and ct suits where uh, the radiation passes through the ionization chambers and uh, uh, it uh, and it uh, and it ionizes the gas that the electrons are converted into positrons and again when the charge gets discharged they produce electricity based on the amount of electricity generated the radiation can be measured this is an example of an ionization chamber as a radiation passes through these chambers the charge of the gas particles gets changed and based on the amount of electricity that gets generated you can measure the amount of radiation photographic effect is also another important effect uh, as we all know that uh, all the x-rays have the property to uh, blacken the photographic films based on this property we can uh, measure the amount of radiation by using film badges so film badges is uh, it can be worn on chest or wrist or other uh, body organs basically it contains uh, extra film which is sandwiched uh, between several filters based on the radiation exposure after radiation exposure the film gets blackened and based on it the radiation will be measured these are some of the pictures showing the film batch dosimeters permanent uh, record but the disadvantages are that uh, there can be easy radioactive contamination from other uh, sources and also uh this uh, film batch can be used only for a period of 4 weeks and again it cannot be reused as compared to tld batches again light exposure and other external factors can also cause an erroneous uh, reading of the dosimeter so finally coming to the tld batches tld batches are nothing but thermoluminescence uh, dosimeter it works on the principle that some of the metals like lithium have a property to absorb uh, radiation and there and uh, in this process the electrons gets raised uh, to a higher orbital levels when again these metals are heated the electrons again come to the neutral level and in this process the light is emitted which is the uh, luminescence thermoluminescence and based on the amount of light which is being uh, uh, which has come out we can measure the amount of radiation So these are typical T, uh, TLD batches which all of us wear during our work. So uh, each TLD batch has got three holes. The top has got an aluminum and copper hole, and middle is is made of plastic, and lower hole is open. And the disc is made up of lithium fluoride and uh, other combinations of uh, metals. so again when radiation falls on tld batches electrons get excited and get to higher energy level and uh, again when they are uh, heated back this the electrons again come to their neutral level and the, in this process they generate uh, light and the light is proportional to the amount of radiation exposure so these are the this is a disc in which there are different metals and you have got uh, the various holes in tld batch so the advantages of not tld batches have replaced uh, and have become almost universal in almost all the institutes uh, the main advantages are that uh, tld batches can be used uh, very frequently like they can use they can be used in every 3 months there is no need to again have a new tld batch and uh, they are also more they are not susceptible to the external factors like light and other factors don't affect the amount of radiation expo uh, radiation reading and they are also cheaper and easy to maintain so you, during radiography when uh, the the tld batch is worn on the chest level and uh, 
when you are doing fluoroscopy it has to it has to be worn behind the lead apron at the chest level coming to radiation protection so radiation protection is very important because uh, the because already we have known that there are very several harmful effects which can come from radiation so it is very important to reduce the radiation levels to the least possible so that we can get the diagnostic information without compromising the patient's health so the main regulatory bodies which uh, give the uh, protocols are the icrb and aerb atomic energy Regu regulatory board and international commission for radiation protection in india it is aerb which is the regulating authority so these are the international guidelines where normal uh, effective dose for a average it has a full term chairman and other members in it and the basic uh, role of aerb is that uh, it sets the guidelines for uh, radiation practice and uh, what are the permissible doses and uh, it also ensures radiation monitoring is being done and it also uh, sets the standards for the all radiation equipment and uh, uh, decides the protocols for radiation installations so the main principles of radiation protection are justification optimization and dose limitation justification is uh, is very important because we need to understand whether the patient really requires radiation exposure or not like for example if the patient has got just an abdominal pain we, we can do other uh, modalities like ultrasound before asking them to go undergo higher modalities like ct scan and they are avoiding radiation and optimization optimization is nothing but uh, by using various techniques if, a, if the patient really requires the radiation exposure optimization uh, the role of optimization is important uh, in this we can use various techniques and other protocols whereby we can reduce the radiation to the maximum level that is a, that is what is the most important that's as low as reasonably achievable uh, as low is what is the minimum radiation which we can give and reasonable it should also be reasonable because we need to get the information from the patient if you reduce the radiation to very low level then we will not get information so we have to follow the alara principle that is the optimum radiation which has to be given so that we get information at the same time we can reduce the radiation to the patient so as i told you about alara so there are some there are some factors which determine the radiation exposure like uh, we we need to have a very good equipment like high frequency three phase generators so this this uh, this ensures that we can get a very good quality x rays like high kv high kv is nothing but high kilo voltage is nothing but you get uh, x rays with good up with with high energy levels and you have to use low ma ma is number of uh, x ray photons and uh, again we can use beam collimators and beam filtration techniques whereby we can reduce the uh, we can use the radiation in a proper way to get good information and uh, other things we can use are the grids and i'll be speaking of all these things in uh, next few slides so high frequency generators so high frequency generators are nothing but uh, the x ray generators which give very high kv beam advantage of high kv beam is that these uh, x rays have high energy photons and uh, they have less scatter and they have greater penetration and uh, since they have more energy they don't get deposited in the tissue and uh, the radiation dose to the patient is less again tube current or ma uh, so ma is milliamperes it is nothing but the quantity of photons while kv is the energy of photons ma is nothing but the quantity of photons if there is more ma then there are more number of photons in that x ray beam so because there are more number of x ray uh, photons there is more radiation dose if you increase the ma so usual protocol that is followed to reduce the radiation is increase the kv and reduce the ma again ma has to be maintained at a level because if you reduce ma to very low level again the energy the number of photons will will reduce and again you not get information so you have to use an optimal ma and optimal kv to get a good image beam filtration so beam filtrations are a technique in which we use filters and which remove the low energy photons and only high energy photons get transmitted 
again beam collimation uh, is a technique where collimators are used where you can reduce the size of the x ray beam table top table top uh, should be uh, having high beam transmission which increases the quantity of diagnostic uh, important photons which reach the film uh, that is the reason why carbon fiber material is used for a transmission table top Sca anti scatter grids G grids are basically used to reduce the scatter radiation and thereby reduce the, uh, and all and thereby increase the x ray quality and uh, we have to use appropriate uh, source to image receptor distance if you reduce the source to if you use short show source to image distance then it increases the patient dose so you have to use always long source to image receptor distance to reduce the patient dose next is uh, radiation protection actions so the, the basic principle is time distance and shielding so these are the three main principles by which we can reduce the radiation exposure time so uh, as we all know if if the radiation exposure goes for more time then uh, the radiation worker and the patient are uh, more exposed to radiation and it increases the radiation uh, exposure to the patient so by reducing the exposure time to the least we can reduce the radiation dose to the patient distance radiation intensity decreases with the distance due to divergence of the beam shielding uh, shielding is very important and uh, shielding is basically we are using materials like lead and uh, other things where uh, we can reduce the amount of radiation uh, exposure by shielding the x rays uh, as we all know lead and other heavy metals they stop be less than 26 millicurie per kg per week uncontrolled areas are the areas where areas outside the x ray unit there the exposure should be less than 2.6 millicurie per kg per week patient waiting area all, all these ma markers have to be these red markers have to be specifically installed near x ray unit and uh, there should also be an alarm in the form of light whenever uh, should warn the people that the x ray is being exposed these are all signboards you can see in almost all the diagnostic departments which warn the patient that this area is uh, there is x-ray investigation being going on in this area and uh, these are restricted areas uh, less than 26 millicure so it is again done with lead this is a CT room where you have normal CT console this is a this is lead thick lead gas this is a CT unit from uh, from the CT actual so the technicians and doctors uh, are separated from the uh, CD, uh, console by lead uh, separator. Similarly, DSC room and the mammo room. All these have got uh, uh, shielding, proper shielding. So, uh, Person, uh, coming to the personal shielding, so all the radiation workers, uh, when they are exposed to more radiation, they, they need to have protective shielding. So, uh, these are the lead prongs. We have got uh, these lead prongs from chest and abdomen. We have also got thyroid shields, neck shields, and we have gonad shields. And these have uh, lead content within them, and that, that stops the radiation from uh, entering. Lead gloves. This is a this is a thyroid shield. These are lead gloves. So lead aprons uh, are uh, personal protective shields. As for recommendations, uh, it is said that 0.25 mm lead thickness will reduce the 66 percent uh, X-ray beam, and 1 mm will reduce 19 percent X-ray beam. But all these lead, lead protective devices can stop only the secondary uh, scatter radiation. Lead aprons have to be uh, have have to be carefully handled if the because there is always a chance because of shielding fails because if there is a crack in lead the radiation will just pass through the crack and uh, the person gets exposed to the radiation 
so the data prones have to be always hung in a proper properly designed racks and they have to be handled carefully so coming to the radiation protection measures for staff if the staff uh, like uh, staff radiation uh, staff who is working in the x-ray unit uh, the protocols we followed are uh, the staff should always be in the control room they should be within the control room and uh, they should always wear tld badges at the chest level when the extra unit is being operated if they are if the staff is being posted for a mobile x-ray and uh, they have to go to ward and they have to take an x-ray then they have to they must wear the the lead aprons because there is no there is no filter should be maintained so these are the various way, uh, pictures showing how the lead aprons has to be used we have got thyroid shields we can uh, we can use even lead glassware for uh, protection for our eyes because radiation exposure can cause there can be leakage radiation leakage from the door now you can see that radiation protection measures for patient yes now for patient yes yes so we have to we have to set the ct protocols very important is that uh, we, we can't use the same protocol for all patients if you have got a pediatric patient their body mass is small so based on their body mass we can reduce the amount of radiation to the to the child and there are set pediatric, pediatric protocols in most of the machines where we can reduce the dose to the very minimum level and get good information and usually try to do one phase of ct scan instead of doing multi phases unless it is required and uh, always do a periodic periodic monitoring has to be done to the machines to see what is the radiation exposure which is being uh, coming out from the machines and most of the machines now have automatic exposure control which which does a fine tuning of the amount of radiation dose that gets exposed so as i told automatic exposure control will automatically reduce the amount of radiation that the patient gets received again the good technique is low uh, lower the kv and ma high, higher the pitch and we have to reduce the amount of uh, uh, length of the scanning area and we have to design the ct protocols so as to uh, for individual uh, patients we we use breast shields especially for uh, females because breast uh, is again organ is very sensitive for radiation again the pearls which are used in radiation protection ct are uh, first is whether it's ultrasound or mri if there is ultrasound and mri uh, chance of doing ultrasound and mri for uh, the patient it's always better uh, to encourage the patient to undergo these administrations to reduce the exposure again uh, it's always it's, it's a protocol to ask every patient whether she's pregnant or not before taking her for uh, ct administration because if the uh, if the accidentally it gets exposed to radiation then there's high risk of uh, anomalies again very important is that uh, what is the radiation dose which is is required we can get a very good image by using a high radiation dose but the same image we can get with a less radiation dose so we have to optimize our radiation so that we get adequate information at the same time we are not over exposing the patient with high radiation again uh, we have to use different ct protocols for uh, by changing the parameters for individual patients the same principles used for mammography uh, mammography point is the compression technique has to be used so that uh, the, it reduces the thickness of the breast tissue and makes it uniform and coming to radiation protection in pregnant patient so uh, pregnant usually we avoid doing uh, ct investigation for any pregnant patient but sometimes there is a definite indication and uh, it's a surgical or medical emergency where patient has to undergo ct so it's very important uh, to ensure patient's radiation safety especially in pregnant first is uh, these samples are they almost uh, every ct machine which are that no pregnant woman should come near the ct machines to avoid radiation exposure 
next, I think coming to pediatric uh, age group. So children again sometimes uh, there is a necessary to under undergo CT. So there are different protocols, pediatric protocol, and we can adjust parameters and we can get the information by using very less radiation loss. The low MA has been used and the uh, has been increased. option for raise hand you can also press the raise hand option then uh, we can ask the questions also If possible, you should take a record of the patient doses that is being given, say, for an X-ray lumbar spine or whatever. And in case of any incident or accident, he must inform the RSO of the site. And the role of the medical physicist. So a medical physicist is an integral part of a department, a radio diagnostic and a radiotherapy or a nuclear medicine center. So they are there right from the inception, from the planning of the facility to preparing the specifications of the equipment as regards radiation protection. He has to participate in review of the radiology practice resources, the budget, the equipment, the staff. He has to carry out testing and commissioning of equipment, supervise the quality assurance procedures, equipment maintenance, the calibration, patient dose assessment, the list goes on. It's a long list. I'm just reading them out, but it's a long list, but each of them are important. Every point is important by itself. So optimization of image protocols, evaluation of any incidents or accidents, and last but not the least, he's the one who should organize the radiation protection training program, because not everybody knows about radiation being a double-edged sword as Dr. Ravikant was already saying. So while, while you can do a lot with it, you can also harm, and you've already seen the effects of radiation injury. So we should all be aware of the hazards that are associated with radiation, and we should also take the adequate means to protect ourselves. The other ancillary staff in the department who are also very important, there are nursing staff, there are general duty attendants, there's sweepers, Everybody needs to be sensitized and trained in radiation protection. They should all be made to feel that they are part of the department, a very important part, a small cog in the big wheel that is radiology. And all of them should be made aware of the radiation hazards. They should be protected. And if there is any incident, then you should take care of that urgently. So a radiographer, remember, is the person who is dealing with so many. There are people um, on top of him 
There are people beside him. There are people beneath him. Remember, you are the chain. You are the link. And you should be aware and should take care of everybody. Now, I will not repeat these. These are the basic fundamental principles, and I'm sure all of them already know these much better than me. I just want to iterate them once again, that you should know why you're doing it. There has to be a justification for the procedure that you are doing. If you think that, yes, this is not the correct procedure, you must go to your senior and check it once more. What about optimization of dose? Yes, you don't want to, just because you have a machine at your disposal, it shouldn't play with the uh, things. You should know that this is the optimal dose for a particular investigation you need to you should not play around with it it's a very serious matter so whatever optimized dose is already set on the machine you should follow that and of course alara as low as reasonably achievable this is something it's like a mantra like we say every day god save me so yes alara it should be in your mind the back of your mind so i was mentioning something about dose incidents where the RSO or the radiologist, or the radiographer, or maybe involved. How do these happen? Yeah, they can happen. I mean, it's not that they cannot happen. You can have by mistake given a very high exposure. You might have just mistakenly given it. It's inadvertent. Nobody will do it deliberately, but it can happen. You're going to just call somebody, but that person didn't hear, and somebody else walks in. It keeps happening. When you double check, you find out the patient with a similar kind of name. You've called Mr. X, but somehow somebody called Mr. XZ has walked in. And what do you do? You haven't really checked once more. So you do your exposure. Patient goes back home. And later, when you're matching all the records, you find you have done the wrong patient. Now, what are you supposed to do? So you must not be scared. You must not hide the truth. You must inform the doctor, the staff, other staff members. Say, please call this man. This man walked in and I took the wrong case. Please call the some this patient. So there'll be a loudspeaker or something. Somebody will go looking. So you must inform don't the RSO if necessary. So the room city, intervention radiology and nuclear medicine. Intervention radiology is coming up in a very, very big way. So is nuclear medicine. So these are areas where a lot of radiation hazard is there and one has to be very careful when we're using these facilities. What is the non-ionizing radiation? Very, very useful uh, two modalities which are raised daily. The ultrasound is like the bread and butter of any radiology department. Thankfully, it doesn't use radiation. It uses a completely different theory on sound waves and that's a different physics altogether which we're not going into today. It's a very, very useful uh, modality of investigation and uh, uh, operator dependent definitely but it has a lot of uses and of course one cannot say anything less about MRI. MRI is magnetic resonance imaging and it uses again a completely different concept of magnetism and radio frequency so we are not going to go into the physics of that also. So your job as a radiographer is. So there is a doctor with the stethoscope who has written the prescription, the requisition of what he wants for this patient. He wants maybe a CTKUB, a NCCTKUB he has written. Maybe he hasn't written. Maybe he's just written to the CTKUB. He hasn't mentioned whether you have to give contrast or not, whatever it is. You have to make sure that the requisition is, is definite. And if you have any doubts, you should go and clear it up right from checking the requisition, bringing in the patient, taking his history, and all the necessary paraphernalia, doing the investigation, making sure that the investigation is done, get the radiologist to get it reported, make sure that it's reported and that everything is correct, the identity of the patient and the report match, and then dispatching it or giving it to wherever the reception or whatever, whatever be the system in your department. Remember, the radiographer is the key to this whole entire chain of events. Your job is just not behind the machine. Your job is right from requisition to report. So in the midst of all this, remember all the things that you had to take care of. You have to take of the radiation. You have to take of your care of yourself. You have to make sure the patient was unharmed. You have to make sure that your other staff members were safe. So that's a very important role that you have to play. So 
X-rays and beyond. Now, when we talk of beyond, and I'm talking of, uh, like I told in my previous slide, of all the other modalities, we are coming into another scenario altogether. While it was just plain X-rays, we had to worry only about the radiation. But whenever you come into special investigations, angiographies, IVPs, bariums, CT, X-rays have now added another, uh, another sort of danger to the whole process. I won't exactly say danger. It is for the betterment of the investigation. But like everything has a double edge. So it also has a sharp edge. So you must remember that edge. And what are the contrast issues that can happen? So with CT, it's the iodinated contrast. With MRI, it's the gadolinium. And with ultrasound, micromobiles. Now, this is a slide. I hope you can see it. the writings are a little small. I'll just read it out to you. So there are, there are the side effects on one side, the side effects, and we have written the three kind of agents. So iodinated contrast, gadolinium, and microbubbles. So I will not read out everything from this chart. Chart is self-explanatory. But remember, number one is hypersensitivity. That's something you have to be very worried about as a radiograph. And nephrotoxicity. Now, the others, metformin lactic acidosis can happen for those who are using it. NSF uh, is used to be used uh, before with the gadolinium chiles, the linear ones, brain deposition. Uh, we, are, we are less using these kind of gadolinium pro, uh, chile compounds nowadays. And thyrotoxicosis can happen to a patient who's already taking medicines for its thyroid issues. But the hypersensitivity and nephrotoxicity, these are, again, the take home two important points in this slide is hypersensitivity and nephrotoxicity. So just a few small things that I would like to talk about, because nephrotoxicity is something you must be a little aware of. So who are the patients at risk from nephrotoxicity? So the risk increases with age. So any patient who's coming to you who is above 70 years of age is at risk because the renal function usually decreases with age. So what is the EGF EGFR that you have to know? So if it's an EGFR which is less than 30 ml per minute for any intravenous injection, and if you're going to give an intra-arterial injection, it has to be more than 45. So these are the people who are going to be more at risk of nephrotoxicity from your contrast. And in case you have to use large doses for investigation, say for NGOs, or you have to use multiple injection of dose of contrast within a very short span of, say, within two to three days, so they are more at risk of nephrotoxicity. So these patients nowadays, they are using hydration, prior hydration, which is beneficial, and there are hydration protocols for it, which I am not going into right now. And... Uh, Lastly, uh, there is a very common uh, thing that happens, which is normally not given as a risk factor anyway, but I just want to uh, say a few words on that, and that is extravasation. So whenever we are using contrast, and we're using uh, usually the intravenous method, we're injecting a vein, it often so happens that there is extravasation of the contrast from outside the vessel into the local tissues. So it doesn't go into your venous and arterial system. It goes into the soft tissues surrounding a vein because you've made a double puncture inadvertently, of course. Now, what happens? What will you do if it so happens? So there's no need to panic, but you have to take a certain measures for it. So what can happen if you do, if there is extravasation? So the skin locally, there might be ulceration, there may be necrosis, or in severe cases, compartment syndrome can happen. So immediately, the rule nowadays is that you should document it. So do not, again, like I said, do not hide it. There is nothing to hide because you are going to be doing something which is beneficial for the patient. So what if there has been a, a double puncture? That can be remedied. So immediately, you should document it and then treat it. How do you treat it? So that limb, you elevate that limb. Okay. So you raise the limb, whichever, say, the hand you have put. So you raise the hand, put ice packs, put a, there are certain gels that are available, thrombophobe, etc. 
and then you monitor and you ask the patient after some time you make the patient wait in front of the room and you monitor and you ask are you having a lot of problems then you console the patient you reassure and then record that yes when you left the patients an hour later it was much better and if necessary you can always refer to the physician for a final check so if there is extravasation take some local steps like i said very simple things and then if necessary refer to the doctor another thing that can happen these two are both iatrogenic the extravasation and the next one that is a pneumothorax a pneumothorax is possible during a lung biopsy procedure it can happen there are means to take care of it so there is inter intercostal tube drainage there are a lot of things it, it has to be referred to the surgeon or the physician whoever under whose care the patient is but it can happen you must record it you must document it and your job is to immediately take care of it so these are the things that can happen now like i said hypersensitivity reaction i've been telling you uh, and because this has to be drilled into your heads so hypersensitivity like alara like tld badge the third point that i would like to get take home message for you today is what happens if there is a hypersensitivity so hypersensitivity is nothing but it's like an allergy if you have an allergy when people say i have allergy to uh, prawns i have allergy to eggs whatever so now this is an allergic reaction of the body to the contrast medium so it is the joint duty of the radiographer the nurse and the radiologist to tackle it so you must be always always be prepared for it so you must have some had training before and how to deal with the reaction if it has happened there has to be some institutional training given to you there has to be a resuscitation resuscitation trolley wherever you're working mainly this happens in the city suit so there has to be a resuscitation trolley with all the emergency drugs you must have the emergency phone numbers of the hospital so whoever is there the doctor the emergency the itu ic whatever you must have the phone numbers of whom to contact because you don't have the time to go out to the room and to call somebody and you must have had taken the patient's history beforehand for any previous illnesses any allergy or any such reaction that might have happened beforehand so the history taking was before you took the patient and that is very very important and then the all the others are after the procedure and if the reaction has occurred so the adverse reactions to contrast media has been classified into four grades the four grades start with a c cutaneous that is the skin and ends with a c the heart the cardiac arrest so it can go from very simple reactions just involving the skin and it can go right up to cardiac arrest that is why we are eternally scared hypersensitivity reactions so there are like cutaneous symptoms like patient will say just have some kind of a rash or something then the grade 2 he might have a little bit of fall of blood pressure he might have a rapid pulse a little bit of cough a little bit of pain abdomen then in a, a more severe form of these itself so he pressure will keep falling he might have tachycardia bad bradycardia he might have arrhythmias he might have bronchospasm and lastly like i said cardiac arrest how do you deal with it again the take home message is a b c very easy to remember airway maintain airway check for the breathing and check for the circulation a b c of anaphylactic reactions take home message again so you just remember these three you don't have to remember anything else because there will usually be doctors or nurses to deal with it but you must keep in your mind what are the a b c's of anaphylactic reactions so what will you be having in your equipment in your ct suit remember airway and breathing so you need oxygen so you will have supplemental oxygen and oxygen delivery devices you will have suction equipment to maintain the airway and clear away the secretions you should have intubation tray with tubes then circulation so you have to give fluids so you need iv cannulas iv fluids and drugs to maintain the pressure so there are multiple drugs which i will be telling you later on and certain ancillary equipments like pulse oximeter 
a blood pressure instrument and an ECG machine if you can. So we need a pulse oximeter, we need a BP instrument, we need an ECG machine, I need a suction equipment, I need oxygen, I need an IV stand with IV fluids and uh, some emergency drugs and an intubation equipment if possible. It can be kept. Okay. So these are the things that you must keep in your CT suit. Now, so treatment of anaphylaxis, what can you do as a radiographer? So first thing is you call for help either by vocal method or by telephone, whichever. So you call for help immediately. You make the patient lie down. If the patient was sitting outside your CT room, maybe you just did the CT and she was just waiting outside and then suddenly the patient says, I'm not feeling well. So immediately make her lie down flat on the ground and raise her legs. Okay. So call for help, make the patient flat, raise the legs, establish the airway. Your, that may not be your job. You want the doctor or the nurse, whoever would have come in by then. So the airway has to be established. Oxygen has to be given in. If the airway hasn't been established, you can always give in through the nose. Then you can keep the channel or the channel by which you injected. You can keep that channel for some time. So you can start fluids by that channel itself. Okay. Sometimes we do keep the channel for some time, even after the CT is finished. We, we wait for five minutes and check and then open the channel. And what are the drugs that can be given? So you have anti-allergics. Basically, it's an allergic reaction. So you can give an anti-allergic chlorpheniramine IM, 10 milligram, hydrocortisone, slow IV, 200 milligram. And while you're monitoring the pulse BP ECG, uh, if there is a, a trained person, adrenaline can be given. Unless the person is trained, it can be given only IM. Only a trained person can give a slow IV. So if it's an IM adrenaline, the dose is 1,000.5 ml, which gives 500 micrograms. And you may have to repeat it after five minutes. So this is a very important slide. So you must keep in mind all these points, okay? So your drugs, your oxygen, your fluids, okay? And the monitoring of the pulse, PP, and the heart. Uh, the next slide is uh, a little miscellaneous. I don't know how much of it you can read. I'll just read out the most important things on in this slide is the patient information or the informed consent. Remember, the standard or the rule today is when you're dealing with the patient, when you're handling with the patient, the patient says, it's my body, nothing about me without me. You cannot do anything to a patient without his consent. So informed consent is very, very important. And the patient has the right to information and the right to make a decision. And you have to respect that. The information has to be present in a way that the patient can understand. So you can't say in Hindi if the patient cannot understand Hindi or you can't say in English if the patient can understand only Bengali. So it has to be in a language that the patient can understand. And the patient has shared in the process with you. You have explained to him and the patient has said, yes, I'm ready to do it. Only then you can go ahead with the procedure. So informed consent has become a very, very important instrument. It's a legal document. It's got a lot of ethical issues so please do not think the patient has come to you you can keep pricking him you can do anything to him and then you can get away with it no those days are gone so apart from right to consent you must also know how to deal with children whether they are what age they are what is the there are different rules of when a child is a minor and when a child is a major the age varies from in our country it's 18 years so the child has come who's the chaperone with him and whether the child cannot give its consent so the guardian has to give. So these are the things which are issues which may become medical legal later on. So you must be careful when you're dealing with these kind of patients. And you must make sure that there are uh, patient attendants. If there's a female patient who's the attendant. Your hospital should have an attendant whenever you're dealing with female patients. So these are very important things. They, they may seem very, very simple, but um, they can turn out into very, very burning big issues later on. And also consent for research. If somebody comes and says, okay, I want your information. I want these images. I want to do research and you're very happy and give it away. Remember, it's a matter of patient privacy. I'll be keep, uh, telling about that later on also. So consent for research, consent for education training. Sometimes some in educated countries, they may not allow trainees to do uh, to do uh, investigations on them. So consent has to be taken that I am 
under training will you allow me to so these are the things which are maybe not so important right now over here but they might become issues in future so you should be aware of this uh, lastly is emergency radiology if a patient has come a road trauma accident patient who's unconscious doesn't have anybody with him you can go ahead and do it and later on perhaps when the attendant comes or when the patient regains consciousness, you can always explain that we had to do this process because you were unconscious and it was needed as it was a life-threatening situation. We had to do this and this on you. But remember, you must remember that. You must inform it, okay? So try to make a habit of it from now onwards so that later on you know how to deal with these cases, okay? You may not get it right now. Maybe you will have one such a case in maybe in five years, but you should know that, okay, this is an emergency case. I'm doing it. What is the procedure for it, okay? So uh, I just want to, uh, I think we have already discussed uh, 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 mammography. So I will not talk much about mammography. And we've already exceeded our time limit. So mammography is a uh, very sensitive, uh, low, uh, it's a soft tissue radiography of the breast and relatively with a relatively higher dose because we are using a low KV. KV range is usually between 24 to 32 and up with a higher MAS. And the breast itself doesn't have a good contrast. So we relatively give a little high dose to the glandular tissue of the breast. So we have to be careful when we are doing mammography about there are breast screening protocols and usually used for older women. And you have to follow the protocols of your region. Okay. So female patients, uh, I again reiterate the use of chaperones, the 10 day rule that uh, you should already be knowing about it, whether the woman is breastfeeding or not. This is important where there is nuclear medicine facility. And remember, with any female patient, please behave responsibly. Pri prioritize, if possible, a female patient if they're there. So try to do them early, handle them carefully, and do not give them unnecessary exposures, multiple exposures, okay? So be very careful when you're dealing with female patients in radiology. I will not say much about ultrasound, about ultrasound because uh, it is a, a very useful and it doesn't have any radiation hazard. But remember, we have the PCPNDT Act. And this, if you are working in a setup where there is USG, this board should always be there in front of the room. So prenatal six determination is not done here. It is a punishable offense. So that has to be there. And you have to make sure that the ultrasound facility has is registered with the respective authority it has the license to do it and that the board is there and there are multiple other boards i've just put up one for your knowledge this is also there so this is part of why we are, i am saying all these things is when you're practicing radiology it, you have to make yourself safe from all respects not only radiation it can come, the attack can come from multiple sources. So it can come from radiation, it can, can come from patient, it can come from the authorities. You must make sure that whatever you're doing, the facility is following the rule, of the, the law of the land. So you are not outside that law and you must make sure that you are, you are doing it properly. Now, a few words on MRI safety. Let's say talking about safety. So um, MRI, uh, again, like I said, it doesn't have radiation. Then why are you worried about MRI? It's a fantastic modality. It, it's like anatomy seeing on, on, on a monitor. It's like you're, you can see yourself on a monitor as good as God made us. But what are we using in MRI? So M stands for magnetic, R for resonance, I for imaging. Now, we are using a magnet. And what does magnets do? They attract metals. So if you put a small steel object in front of a magnet, it immediately will attract it. You remember your physics principle pr experiments when you were in class 11, 12, okay? Those small little magnets we used to calculate the poles, the North Pole and the South Pole, etc. Now ferromagnetic objects in a strong magnetic field can move. That is the worry. And it can move leading to injury, potentially even death. Remember, you read it in the newspaper, somebody talk, took an oxygen cylinder in the MRI room and it was pushed inside and somebody got injured. So these things have happened, can happen. One should always, always be careful. So air and airborne objects can behave as missiles and static or gradient fields can impact on implanted medical devices and cause malfunctions. So if the patient has a device inside him, 
it can malfunction and if there's an object outside it can act as a missile so these are the things and then of course there are radio frequency related risks like specific absorption ratio sar which can cause burns and acoustic noises which can pose a risk to patients because there are a lot of noise pollution in a mr console so usually there will be these kind of labels in front of your mr facility so you can't read them i know but it's just it's it's like says that you know that patients whether they have any implants any devices is it mr unsafe is it mr conditional is it mr safe so the the protocol of the you machine will have whatever these devices you have to find out whether it's an mr unsafe mr safe or mr conditional and uh, when you take your patient into the mr suit should change his street street clothes should wear the hospital given gown should have no metal on him and he should make sure that there are no mr unsafe objects around if there are cables in the room the cables have to be out of the room and kept in a straight line no coiling so okay and no touching the patient and when the patient lies on the table then you must keep an eye and ear on the patient all the time and the patient should not lie with the hands on hips no crossed legs no crossed arms and no touching hips so otherwise it causes a circuit and can cause burns so for mr safety there is a huge list by itself i just touched on some simple points that you have to remember we are coming towards the end of my uh, of my lecture today and i just wanted to say about another point that you have to remember remember we are now going into artificial intelligence and deep learning technologies and uh, a lot of electronic medical information has is at our disposal just imagine i'm sitting here and i'm we are taking, having an I mean, a webinar at far away agartala and you can see me you can hear me and how the data has been transferred so this way all of the world data is being transferred hither and thither now is it all safe and secure remember you have a lot of information a lot of biological information there are a lot of people who die for that information who die to get their hands on it and whatever we have at our disposal it is our responsibility to make sure that it is responsibly kept safely and securely and that we have maintained patient privacy and confidentiality so there are technologies and there are ethical issues regarding de identification and anonymization of patient data that's another topic by itself coming to some general of uh, general things that you, is uh, that we, we we as i mean not as a radiologist as a general hospital fire radiology department please make sure that your fire safety protocol is in place that you have the license from the fire department to perform that covid infections covid and others we have to be sure that we are not doing anything to to increase the risk of contamination in the department we have to make sure from safety from needle pricks needle pricks can happen because we are dealing with a lot of needles and it can happen. so the abc's of a radiographer again always ensure correct identification ask assess check the background check the bed number if you go to the wards make the correct examination take the clinical history to the correct side and site make sure you prioritize a crit critical case and always always communicate there is no 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 better skill than communication the better you speak to a patient to the attendant the doctor the better you grow as a person as a professional you must you must be able to communicate okay so do not stay silent uh maybe a uh, last one or two slides yes the last uh, like covid has again covid 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 has taught us how deadly uh, infection contamination can be hospital acquired infections and others so hand hygiene wearing of personal protection equip equipment sterility decontamination contamination handle your laundry and dispose them carefully 
safe injection. So one needle, one patient, one use, so single use, remember that. Ensure your shop's safety. So where are you disposing your needles and your syringes? You must have the mechanism for it. And make sure that the, the contact, the airborne, the droplet precautions, you have taken sufficient steps. If needed, wear your mask. Make sure your patient is wearing a mask. Make sure that if there has been a patient who's been coughing a lot, you do a little bit of decontamination in the room after the patient leaves, OK? This, we forget about certain things that we're using in the department, like the chin rest, the markers, the USD gel, the USD probes, and many other accessories that we're using. Do not forget to decontaminate them as frequently as is possible, because they are a source of uh, contamination. So I conclude today on a very, I give you a very, very general idea of how what are the things that you have to take care of in a radiology department? It's an, an all-encompassing department with multiple areas nowadays. And every area, every niche has its little problems. They're all beneficial and all for the good of the patient. We just have to keep these things at the back of our mind. There's no need to get scared. There are modalities by which we can prevent them. We can take care of them. But you must have them in your mind. So what the mind does not know, the eye does not see. So uh, in my last slide, I uh, before I, of course, give homage to William Colnerit Troynton, I just wanted to, I was, I was curious, and I found out about the number of people who won Nobel Prize. There are a lot. The list is a very, very, very long list. So we salute all of them today on this special day names of all of them. Most of them are physicists. So while the discovery of X-rays gave the first Nobel Prize to Ranjan in 1901, the other Nobel Prize winners related to the discipline have been many, to name a few. So there has been somebody called M. Von Lowe for the diffraction of X-rays, the Bragg brothers for X-ray spectroscopy, Purcell and Block for NMR, the famous Curies for radioactivity, Lauterbourg and Mansfield for MRI, Monies for Intervention Radiology, and many, many others. I had a laugh because it is interesting to note that no radiologist has won the Nobel Prize for Medicine. The only name that I could find today is Dr. Herbert Abrams of Stanford, Stanford University, USA. He was a part of a team of international physicians for prevention of nuclear war who won the Nobel Prize. Peace Prize in 1985. So with that, I come to the end of my lecture. We again pay our respects on this International Day of Radiography, the theme being radiographers at the forefront of patient safety. So I hope uh, you, were, uh, you could uh, hear me properly, and I hope I could keep your interest and I hope you could just take back maybe three points from all these 37 slides. If you could take back, taken back three slides, then I would be only too happy. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this wonderful and informative session. We have covered all the aspects of patient safety as well as safety for the regular as well. Uh, it will really be beneficial for our students as well as our students who are watching this webinar or this Google Meet as well as from the YouTube. Thank you so much, madam. Thank you. So now uh, we will move forward. Now I will uh, request Dr. Rachel Shah. World Radiography Day. All the years, in the previous years, we are performing we are performing the this day uh, with various way. This year also we are uh, yeah. am I audible? Am I audible? Am I audible to you? Yes, Rahul, am I audible? Now, our honored guest have come from 
डॉक्टर रोबिकांत चीफ रेडियोलॉजिस्ट एंड एसयूटी डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ रेडियोलॉजी जसुदा मेडिकल जसुदा हॉस्पिटल हैदराबाद एंड अनदर मैडम डॉक्टर सुपर्णा मजुमदार प्रोफेसर एंड एसयूटी डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ रेडियोलॉजी रेडियो डायग्नोसिस चित्रंजन नेशनल कैंसर हॉस्पिटल कलकत्ता तो very interesting thing and the very complicated things also discussed today and which is enriched us by all means dr robikant he has also taken the first lecture given the first lecture that is on the radiation protection and measures how to maintain how to reduce the doses and to be care of the patient on all aspects and our madam the professor ram mojumdar uh, of national cancer hospital or institute of calcutta she has explained so many things both radiological side and the management and also clinical side very interesting topics she has mentioned in various aspects first of all she has mentioned that this day is a, not only the world radiography day this is also a bark day of x ray very interesting bark day of x ray <coughs> she has mentioned about the radiation protection and the justification of three we are, we know about the alara she has also mentioned this thing they also mentioned the duty of radiographer you graph <clears throat> right from registration right from registration we are check the we have to check the uh, all the things before going to the uh, before uh, giving exposure it is the duty of radiographer to check the name age uh, and the uh, um, chief complaints also you should know and uh, you that it you still mention the site determination and uh, this things this important things to be uh, checked first and um, that is these are all under identification so that no confusion takes place if same x rays are being done uh, which are misplaced or displaced that's why radiographer should be very much careful about this point and uh, mm. if the side effects she has mentioned about the side effects a very important thing while particularly doing the uh investigation contrast studies all the times we find after pushing the contrast we get uh, some sort of reactions which are under the minor reaction minor reactions can be uh, minimized or controlled in the department itself because the department, department is having a emergency tray of medicines including the oxygen including the oxygen first of all we know i do not i should not go in details about this point because everybody knows this thing so management how is done according to the severity of the cases and uh, first of all they give the medicine in the department second thing at the same time they communicate it to the doctor under whom this patient is being treated and uh, uh, if not possible uh, at the same time also we call the anesthetist also and uh, considering the severity of the case patient is uh, shifted to the uh, department or the research station room the research station room is a very important room in every big hospital this is a room using it as they are and our uh, evaluate the patient we evaluate the patient and she also also mentioned about the management or the how to do the emergency uh, <coughs> radiology emergency radiology uh, or sometimes emergency x-ray is also done if suppose a road accident is there uh, she has been run over and injury of the abdomen severely the patient may come with a uh, prospective kidney kidney injury or kidney rupture uh, patient will pass urine 
blood urine and we do the emergency x-ray or first x-ray KOB, then we go for your uh, IBU, IBU or IBT to, to see whether kidney has been exposed, uh, NG injured or um, contrast has gone outside the kidney boundary. That is called research, uh, Madam has also mentioned the extravasation of the contrast or extravasation of the, any single injection also can be extra, extra uh, recession may be there. And this can be managed by just uh, pushing the hyaluronidase or uh, if, uh, other things. Anyway, and in case of, uh, I mean, your uh, allergy, we can put, we are giving here, piriton and also adrenaline. And these are the management in the department. And uh, emergency X-ray, patient should be treated accordingly. Emergency access patient should be treated immediately. Madam also mentioned about the, you know, to be alert about the PNDT cases, uh, because nowadays it is a very important thing. Anyway, uh, we have been much more enriched by your valuable lectures and what to, what to be done, what to, to do by radiologist as well as the radiographer and also the doctors under whom the patient is being treated. Very interesting topics we have uh, heard today by our guest lectures for coming from Hyderabad and from Calcutta. I was a student of data from MBUS and also radiology. I completed my radiology study in the year 1978. And I joined my uh, institute, uh, Agatkala uh, General Hospital, GB Hospital and then anywhere. And now I am attached to this institute. It is a very good institute in the Northeast region. Our Tipur Institute of Medology, our Tipur Institute of Paramedical Sciences. Students from here now working in different parts of the India, even abroad. Very interesting. And uh, it is, we, are, we are lucky enough that our students are going different parts of the India and doing work very uh, emphasis. The, this is the this was institute has completed about 14 years. Uh, I am attached from the day of inception. Anyway, uh, I am not <laughs> just I am talking of my own discussion related to discussion, my own core talks. Anyway, we are very much enriched by both the Robitan and also by our Madam Supermajinda. Uh, Anyway, um, next time also we are expecting you in the same medical day. So thank you all our today's program. In other years it was very widely uh, circulated and also I think, uh, so many things, so many persons joined in this occasion in other years before Corona. And nowadays any you are completing we are doing this function in a very short way using by on like the uh, online system by the online system this is the third year i think anyway uh, i'm very much glad uh, as uh, it is been uh, our students are also attended here so thank you all thank you management thank you my students thank you my colleagues and uh, thank you my principal madam who is reached, we, 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 uh, Madam is present here from the, just from the starting point, that is at, from 3 p.m. So she is also very much interested and other colleagues of our department of RIT course, they are also attached here and also waiting, by, sitting by myself. So anyway, I did not, I like, don't like to, uh, Lengthening my short speech. This is the short speech given by me. Uh, so far, has come to my mind. So one thing is this. Uh, and one thing. Well, sometimes we say from quoting from the medical profession or from medical teaching that we know. I do not see what mind does not know. Madam is also has also mentioned this point. Very interesting and also we can.
mention this thing to other one function also and we can say the if i uh, This is okay. With this, uh, we will end our webinar now. Thank you so much uh, to our honorable speakers of today's webinar, Dr. Ravi Kansal, Dr. Suparna Majumdar, Madam, uh, to uh, give uh, your valuable time from your busy schedule. Thank you so much. And uh, our principal, Madam, thank you so much. Most